I don't think I formally actually stated this. I think I have it in other ones, but let's just reiterate this for those who are newcomers. This will actually be part five of a multiple part series where I will be ranking the top 100 best senators in US history based upon how I like them. Essentially a compilation of multiple mini who is episodes, which doesn't even matter considering people on the list can get who is episodes. After we go through the 100, we're gonna re-rank them based on how they truly are. And the only reason I include that last part is so I can rectify this video not really even being that good, considering many other people that I've learned about since making that episode. The formal rules for the lists will be as follows. One, the lists are essentially self-contained. While I have tried my best to make sure that the ones on this list are worse than the ones that are supposed to be above it, I will say that there are a decent number of people on this list that probably would be ranked higher had I know about them prior. So to make it easy, we're really just going self-contained in each list. The person who's on the bottom of this list is worse than the person who's on the top of this list. And that's really all it is. The person who's on the top of this list could be ranked way lower than the people in the previous lists, or ranked higher. Or I don't know. Two, we'll be focusing on their tenures in the Senate, rather than any other offices that they held. We could have had a person who had a really great house tenure, and then when they became a senator, they went terrible, or vice versa. And let's just say hypothetically a person on this list is a person who is just personally terrible. Did they do a good job in the Senate? And maybe I'll overlook it, maybe I won't. I mean, barring some very obvious exceptions. I just mean more generally them being like a, like a jerk. Three, incumbents are going to be kept to a very minimum amount. Because let's be real, modern day Senate isn't sending their best. There might be incumbents in future lists, hopefully not. Leave some comments about some people that I probably have never heard about, and maybe you can replace them. And last but not least, this is obviously my opinion, so if there are people on this list that you don't like and can't provide an actual legitimate reason for me to not have them on this list, other than the fact that, oh, I don't like them. So it's like, I mean, that stinks for you, I guess. Sorry. And yeah, let's just do it. Let's just get to it. Here are the top 15 more best senators, part five. Number 15, Matthew M. Neely. Neely was the senator of West Virginia during three separate time periods. And each time, he delivered a stark contrast from the rest of the South. And yes, this primarily has to do with race. Very early on, Neely was touting around an anti-lynching bill, which died thanks to his Southern colleagues. He was also one of the many people refusing to sign the Southern Manifesto due to the fact that it was very racist in nature. During his term, he would also become the chair of the Senate Committee on the District of Columbia, where he would be a primary advocate of home rule of DC by the majority African American population. Unfortunately, it didn't pass during his tenure. Another interesting tidbit is that he would end up mentoring George Crockett Jr., a member of Congress who would end up being at the founding convention of Democratic Socialists of America. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got for him. He's not racist and actually did well to advocate for African American rights, which is of course very commendable. Number 14, Vance Hartke. Hartke was a senator from a dying breed, Midwestern populists, becoming Indiana senator right before the 60s. Hardkey would begin his tenure by hitching himself to LBJ, helping him push his great society. Aspects Vance did on his own were pushing for increased student loan programs, the Head Start program, and pushing to make kidney dialysis more available. He also pushed hard for the interests regarding transportation, helping form Amtrak, and after his sis died in a wreck, safety regulation in cars. But as is typical with people who got on this list, the one place where he diverged with LBJ was in regards to the Vietnam War. But otherwise, he's just kind of above average. Number 13, Hiram Revels, the first black senator and one that has an entire episode dedicated to him. Revels was best known for his advocacy of African American civil rights, using his own oratory skills as proof that African Americans deserved those rights. Arguing against the segregation of DC schools and four black workers in the Washington Naval Guard, 
He was also known with clashes with his more radical members of his party, who wanted very harsh punishment towards the ex-Confederates. Meanwhile, Hiram argued that after a loyalty pledge, they should focus on helping people rather than continuing harsh divides. Which, rather well-intentioned, albeit wrong. Which also did, to a degree, show a good element of character of him. He was more focused on helping people rather than necessarily focusing on punishment and retribution. Hiram unfortunately didn't get to do much as he was appointed for a one-year term, but overall his tenure was really good. Number 12, Henry Clay. The guy who did so much and yet so little. Clay is a very prominent figure in US politics, and yet it took him this long to make it in my top senate list, and I'll be frank, this one is kind of generous. Clay was well known for being a leader in the opposition to the Democratic Party of the mid 1800s, and that entailed quite a few things. And despite the fact that at the time, he and the Whigs would have been considered right wing, it seems that a lot of the things that he actually advocated for would be more comfortable amongst the US left, or at the very least US liberals, which in that case is like, I guess the label makes sense. Clay was an opponent of slavery and the Indian Removal Act, but his biggest opposition came from the creation of the American System Economic Platform, which entailed high tariffs to keep industries in the US, maintaining high land prices to generate revenue, preserve a national bank to stabilize currency, and put a lot of money into national infrastructure. Which, yeah, very basic, but I mean, doesn't sound that bad to be honest. Well, I mean, except for this one. But yeah, otherwise just kind of average, I can kind of see why he kind of fades into the background, but he still played a notable role nonetheless. Now, if only he actually knew how to win the presidency. Number 11, George Frisbee Hoare. <laughs> Who names their kid George? Frisbee, as he was called, was well known for his history of anti-racism, opposing discrimination against Native Americans, African Americans, and even the Chinese, arguing that the Chinese Exclusion Act was nothing less than the legalization of racial discrimination. Frisbee also advocated for women's suffrage as early as 1886, opposing the Edmunds Tucker Act that made women unable to vote in Utah, also being a noted opponent of US imperialism. And despite the fact that we look at him and think of him as coming from the prim proper era of politics, he was also well known for throwing a few jabs at opponents. Such as telling a Republican that was planning to vote for Grover Cleveland, there was a time when I hoped to meet you in heaven. It is gone. And considering he actually believes that, it means something. The one thing that I can really say about Hoare here is the fact that he didn't live up to his name. It was the rest of the Senate that did. Number 10, Zachariah Chandler, one of the founders of the Republican Party. But don't worry, we won't hold that against him. He didn't know. Zachariah was well known for being part of said radical faction, very much supportive of abolition, and making sure those traitors got what they deserved. Even calling out the fact that Lincoln was way too moderate on those issues. One of the earliest things that got Zachariah in the mainstream was a speech decrying George McClellan's prosecution i.e. prolonging of the war, arguing that it was the most important thing he ever did. Zachariah even doing something funny in response to the UK doing shady things during the Civil War. While the UK officially remained neutral during the war, they had declared the Dixie Suckers as a belligerent force and had allowed their ships to head to the UK in order to be armed in British ports. So Zachariah penned a bill basically saying that the US would do the same thing to the nation of Abyssinia who was facing a conflict with the UK. Don't dish out what you can't take my friends. Number 9, Gerald P. Nye. This is a person that I didn't think I would put on the list and you'll see what I mean when I get into it. Nye was one of the many midwestern populist senators getting his start in the agrarian reform movement loading big business and supporting the farmers. He started controversy immediately upon his career, as he was actually appointed to his seat initially. Th that story is actually pretty funny. Apparently, Gerald Nye ran for a house district in this state of North Dakota, 
Then, when the Senate seat was open, him and a bunch of supporters showed up to the governor's office and demanded the seat be given to him. And the governor just said yes for some reason, leading to the Senate trying to refuse to seat him, but would ultimately having to do so, as when the special election rolled around, Nye ended up winning. He would continue not making friends because he started going after some corrupt and controversial elements in U.S. politics, starting a subcommittee to investigate the Teapot Dome scandal. However, he would become more notable due to his stances on foreign policy. Like many senators from the Midwest, he was more in the non-interventionist crowd, which would lead to him creating a committee that we colloquially call the Nye Committee, a congressional committee that would investigate the connections between U.S. businesses and the First World War, concluding that the banks and munitions industries had unjustly pushed the U.S. into the war and declared them to be merchants of death, even calling out former President Woodrow Wilson to the point where an ally of his had slammed his fist so hard it started to bleed. Now this sounds pretty good. Why was I hesitant to put him on the list again? Well, that's because this committee was started around the time the U.S. was debating getting involved in a certain other war. And he used the arguments for this to start arguing against the U.S. getting involved. And if you know anything about this time period, you know there was a very, very thin line between good-intentioned criticisms of the U.S. entering the war and very malicious reasons why the U.S. wanted to lead, not get involved in the war. With the line sometimes getting even more thin, as I've talked about in a previous episode, and based purely on looks, I was concerned that he might be more in the latter crowd than the former crowd. But after doing some more research... I did end up thinking that he avoids that fate for three reasons. Apparently, Nye was very actively supportive of the anti-fascists during the Spanish Civil War. During his congressional tenure, there was a primary election for the Montana Republican Party between two people. Both of the candidates opposed U.S. entry into World War II. One was a pacifist, one was a fascist. Nye, again, chose the path of anti-fascism. And lastly... Despite the fact that Nye was accused of anti-Semitism, he had actually helped Jews during the Holocaust, helping bring at least 125 Jewish refugees into the U.S. to avoid persecution. So he seemingly passed the smell test. Maybe information can be brought up later that'll prove me wrong. Ernest Lundin didn't have a lot of his information be brought back into public light until Rachel Maddow did her show, so maybe there's something else there. Number 8. Homer Truett Bone Bone is a very interesting, as he's one of two senators that I know that openly admired Eugene Debs. After a career in minor party politics, Bone would join the Democrats to partake in that sweet New Deal coalition magic that FDR had. While signing off on most of FDR's domestic policy, Bone sought to shift the administration leftward. One big way was through the idea of public ownership citing the success of his home city Tacoma after they began a city-run electric industry. Another thing he sought to nationalize was Boeing, concluding that if he removed the financial incentive from them, the U.S. would not be involved with as many military conflicts, a la Merchants of Death. But neither of those things ended up happening, despite Bone's wishes, but one thing he did help create was the National Cancer Institute alongside Matt Neely. So yeah... One more point for reformist socialism, my friends. Number 7. Birch Bay, senator from Indiana from 1963 to 1981. Bay represented a faction of the Democratic Party, which many still adhere to. Rural liberal populists, and Bay was put in a perfect position to advocate for change in the nation with the new tides of the decades, serving as the chair of the Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments. And Bay did not take this position lightly pushing for multiple constitutional amendments during his tenure as he saw certain things were not satisfactory with the current constitution. The 25th Amendment to formalize the process of the VP's ascension and set up rules for possibly removing a president earlier if needed. The 26th Amendment, which allowed for 18-year-olds to vote due to the large political activity of the college-age demographic. Pushing hard for the Equal Rights Amendment in response to the Women's Rights Movement 
And lastly, a bill that sadly did not pass, a bill to abolish the Electoral College in response to the slight concerns surrounding the 1968 election, which would have completely overhauled the presidential election and instituted a runoff system, which was the closest that we have ever gotten to abolishing the Electoral College. Bro, why can't we be in that era again? There was a tiny slight hindrance of a problem and they were almost close to literally doing a complete overhaul. Now we have massive institutional problems and they can't even lift a finger to do nothing. This is the reason why incumbents are at a minimum. Number six, Tom Harkin. Harkin's a rather interesting senator. Seemingly the last Midwestern Democratic senator that didn't need to run to the right to win, not even remotely. Harkins, again, one of those rural populists that seems to be a big trend for this time period in the era, even initiating a campaign for president under those ideals, pushing for progressive outcomes during his 30 years in the Senate. While supporting Obamacare, he ultimately understood that a single-payer system would be better for the US overhaul. He pushed hard for stem cell research and was 100% in favor of Roe v. Wade. However, two prominent bills that Harkin pushed during his time period were the Minimum Wage Fairness Act of 2013, which would have raised the federal minimum wage to $10.10 .10 an hour, which all of us know didn't really pan out. But I think we all agree, much like Bernie Sanders' planned fifth time minimum wage, that would have worked fine for the time period. Now that's basically impossible. But his most famous bill is, of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 which sought to help people with disabilities not get discriminated against alongside actually accommodating the disabled community in the United States, even giving his speech in support of the bill in American Sign Language so that people like his brother could understand. Harkin was so passionate about the issue, he even understood the fact that there are some cases where the ADA doesn't go far enough and would frequently introduce amendments to fix the flaws of the ADA and how people would handle it. Come on, bro, you can't get mad at somebody for advocating for the disabled. Number five, William Morris Stewart. Stewart was well known for being one of the leading bimetallist senators, at least on the GOP side, joining both the Silver Party and the Silver Republican Caucus and facilitating an alliance with the Populist Party. He was not liked when he was in the Senate, apparently giving speeches about capitalistic vampires so often that other senators could repeat his rants verbatim. You know, I'm starting to realize maybe this whole red baiting isn't really working when there are so many senators in the past that literally just openly oppose capitalism. Stewart was also well known for being the guy who created the 15th Amendment, the one that made it illegal to stop someone from voting on account of race, color, or previous condition in servitude, which puts him at a really unfair advantage when it comes to ranking him because... Come on. Number four, Harley Kilgore, another senator from West Virginia who would hold the seat that would soon be afterwards held by a Klansman and a mansion. Kilgore would prove that those two were massive downgrades. Similar to another West Virginia senator on the list, he was one of the few to oppose the Southern Manifesto and supported racial integration. Another piece that made Kilgore an interesting contrast was his opposition to the McCarran Act a bill that attempted to ban the Communist Party proposed by a literal fascist. But the one thing that Kilgore is best known for is the creation of the National Science Foundation, a government agency specifically focused on scientific development and research. Another thing that earned him a lot of attention was chairing a subcommittee on antitrust and monopolies, where Harley explained that the US was entering a third great merger movement. What? That's crazy! but Harley died before he could finish work on the committee. So basically, the thing that makes him one of the best senators from West Virginia is he's a complete antithesis of everything that West Virginia stands for. Number three, Lyndon Baines Johnson. LBJ is quite literally the personification of a politician. Backroom deals and arm twisting were part of this man's DNA. The man began his Senate career as the most junior senator and ended it as the leader of the Senate Democratic Party. Like, for real, that's commendable regardless of your political takes. LBJ was well known for the treatment, where he would confront his opponents in a very intimidating manner and would use every method to make sure that they change their votes to support whatever bill he needed them to, not even giving them a chance to interject. 
he was able to use this power to make NASA pass several civil rights bills, according to some against his own belief system, but that's a little bit dubious to be fair. And even defend Israel. <laughs> hey, if he was immune from flaws, he would have been in one of the earlier lists. It's no secret how LBJ managed to finagle his way into the US presidency. No, not in that way, you idiots. Number two, Daniel Akaka, the first senator of native Hawaiian ancestry, also a former member of the US military. As such, he was focused on both issues when he would serve in the US Senate, serving on the committees of both veterans and Indian affairs. Akaka voted against the US creating more veterans in Iraq while trying to help the ones that were not being assisted, such as the Philippine scouts who were denied veterans benefits, among awarding many other Asian American soldiers medals of honor, a thing that earned him enough support to be an honorary Filipino citizen. But the thing that caught my eye when looking into his record was the Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act, which sought to get Native Hawaiians more autonomy over the state, which Akaka flat out admitted could have possibly led to Hawaiian independence. Look, I'll be real, of all of the US states that have independence movements, Hawaii just makes the most logistical sense to me. Like, right under the territories, right above Alaska. And significantly ahead any southern state. Overall, yeah, he just seemed really interesting of a senator, especially this late into the game. And was a very notable person from Hawaii. And to close off this list, number one for now, Harry Lane. A very fascinating senator of his time. Lane was very interesting up to his election to Senate, where apparently the view was that the race was so divided that he was barely able to squeak by. And then when he went on to serve, he made himself known as a vast contrast from the rest of the members. He was vastly opposed to how the US treated the Native Americans, literally calling it what it was. The, the white, white man, man is destroying them and is at work taking everything they have. Lane was also a prominent voice for women's suffrage, introducing resolutions to enact it nationwide. He supported state-owned industries and was a huge anti-imperialist, opposing the US intervention in the Mexican Revolution and World War I, both filibustering it from continuing and introducing a bill to bring the war to its end, the latter earning him enough ire to warn newspapers in his state to ream the F out of him. I mean, I know I may be coming off a little too strong here, but the dude sounds like a borderline socialist. But my question is, which side of the border is he on? Because I personally think that Lane is very obviously a socialist. And here's some reasons why I think so. His rhetoric is of course very socialistic minded. I mean, go on socialists, name me parts of his platform that you disagree with. Speaking of, who do you think he got to help him write those bills? Robert M. LaFollette and Meyer London. At the very least, one and a half socialists right there. And last but certainly not least, his daughter and her husband were members of the Socialist Party during his tenure in the Senate. Now you might be saying, so? Who cares? I mean, not everybody's family's political views seem to relegate towards them. But the thing is, these two would end up joining Lane's congressional staff while remaining members of the Socialist Party, literally serving as liaisons between Lane and Big Bill Haywood, who would pressure him to try and get clemency to Joe Hill. I would argue that this dude is pretty much a fellow traveler of the Socialist Party of America. But aren't we all? So yeah, Senate, more senators off the list, alright? Join me next year when maybe I do top 20 or top 15 or top whatever. Or maybe the series gets cancelled, I don't know. You decide. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and click the bell to notify when a future video mine comes out. And if you want more content from me, consider supporting me on Patreon.